hello, g good afternoon, everybody. Um, <coughs> so the, the question uh, is around um, access and whether it's getting harder for humanitarian organisations. <coughs> I, I think the first thing to say really is that one really only looks needs to look at the those conflicts that are uh, or those contexts that are in the media these days to realise that it's certainly not getting any easier. When when one looks at Syria, when one looks at northern Mali, Mali when one looks at uh, Afghanistan, when one looks at um, Somalia. Um, that being said, um, I think we, we the first point I need to make really is that in terms of access, you, you, you one shouldn't have a kind of global uh, view on all of this. It, it really is very much context specific. Um, and for us in ICRC, it really is one of the biggest challenges um, is how we can actually get access to, to victims. Um, and not only is it a, a one of the biggest challenges, but it's a continuous challenge. We really need to work in day in, day out, uh, week in, week out, month in, uh, month out, uh, etc. And I think we'll have a chance later to talk about the history of ICRC in Somalia and other places, which is a testament to the amount of time and perseverance you need to, to invest to get access. <coughs> and is there a related question here? I'll just jump to that, if I may, Sarah, before I come to you. And that is, what do you do, ICRC, when you have this doctrine about not using armed escorts. What do you do in ongoing conflict areas, South Central Somalia or even Syria? What do you do? Do you not go in if you need armed escorts or do you, <coughs> what do you do in those dangerous situations as ICRC? Well, uh, I mean, the, the short answer um, is that the with the one exception in Somalia where we used armed escorts um, in relation to a very specific criminal threat or the threat of bandits and kidnapping, um, ICRC does not uh, use armed escorts um, in terms of um, gaining um, access and acceptance. Uh, the, the approach we have, I, I may be skipping ahead a little bit on this one, Dennis, but the approach we have <coughs> is to build what we call acceptance and trust. Uh, and we do this primarily through adherence over time to our, uh, our humanitarian principles, the, 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 the kind of <coughs> core uh, approach of ICRC is to rely on, on neutrality, on in independence, uh, and on impartiality. And then it becomes a long process of nego negotiating access with all parties to the conflict, um, with, the, with the government, of course, but also with, the, um, <coughs> with opposition groups. Uh, and through this dialogue and consent and trust and acceptance, we, we, we attempt to, to, to build access. Okay, thank you. Sarah, I'm coming to you. Um, Perhaps you could tell us a bit about how you see the current challenges to humanitarian agencies' mm -hmm. access to conflict or complex situations. Are they <coughs> new? Are they different? Or are we getting more of the same and forgetting the past? What do you mm. think? I think Brian has said it very clearly, you know, they are very much context specific and I think there is a bit of a, a mindset in the sector that sees them very much associated to, you know, attempts um, by parties to armed conflicts to block access intentionally, you know, be that governments <coughs> or armed non state actors. But actually, the challenges to, to access are, are you know, uh, very multiform. I mean, the, the most obvious one is obviously uh, insecurity, you know, be that military operations, active fighting, or, you know, threats to humanitarian personnel, schools, and facilities. That is what blocks access more often than, than um, most. Um, logistics difficult terrains. Uh, if I think about, you know, lack of infrastructures or, or damaged infrastructures that does not allow, you know, uh, organizations to reach affected populations, uh, how many rainy seasons in Sudan and South Sudan have we spent, you know, stuck unable to, to reach um, affected populations because of the lack of roads. Um, and then, of course, there are the bureaucratic restrictions, you know, um, on personnel and humanitarian supplies. And some may be intentional, but, you know, very often they're also part of a culture of government, also on the side of the opposition, that, you know, it's not deliberately about blocking access, it's about, you know, a way of conducting business in a state that, you know, often interferes with the, you know, the ability of humanitarian organizations to respond. <coughs> but there are other challenges that I think we reflect upon a bit less frequently, and one is our own ability to deploy rapidly 
and to deploy consistently <coughs> in all the crises. Um, and that's something that, you know, the sector, uh, we're not always very good at being self-critical, self but I think in there are an, a, a very large number of crises in which we don't de deploy, and access is largely because we're not there, the, the, the problem. Um, and acceptance of the communities. You said, um, Brian, you know, this is at the heart of what the SCRC uh, focuses on, and, and that's very important to, you know, make sure that you can have access. And related to that, I think <coughs> one other problem is um, the lack of the familiarity with the legal framework on the side of, you know, both belligerents, um, you know, states and non-armed state groups, but also humanitarian relief organizations that very often are not familiar with the legal framework and therefore um, do not, you know, negotiate their access um, adequately. Um, and, and, and that is part of, you know, why I think we, we're facing the challenges more and more today. And uh, are they new, or do you think they're just more of the same in, in, in general terms? Are they? I don't think the challenges are new, but there are a lot more actors than there were before. And you know, where you see, especially in terms of the lack of familiarity with the legal frameworks, we have a lot more organisations that are less familiar with the legal frameworks, and and therefore engage less in adherence with the IHL or you know using the the, uh, the framework the IHL provides. And I think that's why we see the mm -hmm. you know uh, mm -hmm. what we perceive as being a greater problem. Mm -hmm. But we've always said to negotiate for access. <coughs> this is not new. You know, there was never an era where access was, you know, <laughs> offered um, freely. I mean, we, we've done a lot of work on this in HPG, and, and we've, you know, the, our research has shown very clearly that there has never been a golden um, age of you know, humanitarian space or humanitarian access. Yeah. On the contrary, you know, perhaps with exception of the immediate post-Cold War areas in a couple of countries, you know, with the operation of France Sudan, or perhaps uh, in other contexts, generally has always been, you know, very challenging for organizations to negotiate their access into crisis. Right. Mark, could you give us a, a view from MSF? Or do you have a similar, well, first, a similar analysis, and do you have a similar approach to the ICRC? Do you agree that these challenges are more of the same, perhaps different in some respects? I mean, could you give us your first take on that? And could you also perhaps touch on, on either, of any of you can do that as well, because Imran is not here, partner organizations and remote control mm -hmm. programming issues. You know what I'm talking about. If you want to touch on those as well, please do. That was a, a pretty broad remit. Um, yeah. I, I think to start off, I, I, I agree completely with what I've heard from Brian and Sarah. I, I don't think the challenges are new. But I do think that, that these old challenges confront us in a different way today. I mean, I would say, first of all, you know, we've changed. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, the, 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 the global NGO community was not what it is today. I mean, today we're actors who will not hesitate in some circumstances, to call a meeting of the United Nations Security Council, who have integrated into assistance work to a far greater degree than before the whole humanitarian protection agenda. So we are asking to go inside uh, of a country and w with, you know, a, a lot of governments that will see us as, you know, an extension of the human rights community, uh, 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 an actor who may very well <coughs> use the information, use what we see or witness on the ground against that government. So. You know, we've changed. I think also just, you know, global politics have changed. I mean, they're, they're, the West has been a, a very active belligerent actor, and there are now more, you know, there, there is a more polarized, there's a schism in, in some ways where there are those who would view us as a, a largely, you know, a, an extension of this Western liberal agenda, you know, the, the Western NGO. And even though we, we in, for instance, in MSF, believe ourselves to be a global actor, that would not necessarily be the perception of others. And I think. We've always been that way. We, you know, we, we you know, uh, in some ways we are infused with our uh, with our Western origins, but at the same time that means something different in in today, you know, in a place like Syria or <coughs> Afghanistan or Somalia than it used to. And then, you know, I, I think to a certain extent, uh, governments have changed. Uh, governments, governments, there have always been governments who, you know, uh, you know, put in place bureaucratic controls and things like that. But they're they're simply a larger number of them, and uh, they, they seem more capable. I mean, UNDP has been doing good work. Governments now have developed <laughs> administrative capacity, and you're no longer, as an NGO, able to just show up, drive around, stick your missions and your projects wherever you want without any permission, without telling the Ministry of Health or anything like that. And I think added into all of that is that just the location, and you know, we were talking about this over lunch, the fact that there are so many more internally displaced people now means that often you are trying to work in the very place where sometimes there's conflict, but also the very place where 
uh, the, the government or those who control your access may have a reason not to want you there, mm -hmm. as opposed to the old days of the refugee camp where governments were all too happy to have you run around and, and deliver aid to you know, these foreigners who were on their, their territory. So I, 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 don't think the challenges, uh, uh, I don't think the challenges are new. I think there are new challenges to the old, you know, sort of the old way of doing things. Um, just because we've all changed, things have, uh, we've all gotten grayer uh, and, and <laughs> things like that. Um, you asked a little bit, of, uh, I, I don't want to exactly, uh, it's well, hard to say what, how we're different from, from the ICRC uh, uh, in terms of that, I think we're almost exactly the same in terms of that idea of, well, we, we, we need acceptance and, and we need, we are not an armed actor, we, we need parties to accept and in order to gain that acceptance, we need the, them to believe that essentially that we are independent, neutral, and impartial. So we need to pay attention to, um, yeah, to those principles. I think also, you know, we need parties to believe that we're useful to them. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, you know, a real politique analysis of it. But you know, at a certain point, uh, y y y people will not want you there if you pose risks, for instance, through speaking out or something else, and you, you're not delivering anything for them. So you have to have relevant programming uh, that does something for the for the people on the ground. Um, I suppose the, the you know the easy ways in which we differ from MSF is, I think ICRC with its with its mandate uh, and, and with its it, it, its internationally agreed diplomatic role has an ability to leverage that high level diplomatic uh, relationship that, that, we, that MSF don't. We come at it as an international actor, but it's not quite that same. It, it, we're not, we don't have that same position, that diplomatic position. And then I think to a certain extent it's also the fact that we will work without the permission of a government to be in a particular location, uh, whether you know, it, it's cross-border or simply uh, w within a country uh, without their permission. I think nowadays probably less and less just because, yeah, if they know you're there, it's not going to, you know, it might not be very pretty. Um, uh, but th there is that ability to work without permission. And then lastly, uh, you know, I think we would differ in the ways we would use public communication around some of this, and uh, whereas I think ICRC would uh, would have a, a much greater uh, ability to leverage diplomatic channels, uh, we would have a, probably a, a greater pro pro uh, proclivity to to use public channels to try and exert the kind of pressure we, we might need to be able to to enter a place where you're being denied access. Mm. Thank you very much. Can I add one thing about you know the fact that we have changed? I think one thing that has changed is also. Um, the, the, the aspiration, perhaps the interest, the determination of humanitarian organizations to be present in very um, violent contexts, much more than before. Mm -hmm. And I think that also exposes us a lot more than before to the difficulty of accessing the populations because we you know, tend to deploy, we try to deploy as humanitarian organizations in contexts that perhaps 20 or 30 years ago we would have just yeah, deemed um, off bounds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Could I just, before I come to you, uh, Brian, with the next round, pick up something Mark mentioned, IDPs, displaced populations. I don't know if you saw IDMC. Norwegian Refugee Council figures this morning, world record levels of displacement, 28.2 million, 28.3 million, 28.8 million, sorry. Uh, IDPs last year registered, uh, twice the global refugee figure, six million and a half more last year, particularly Syria, et cetera. So, I just flagged that because I think access, in my view, but see what you all think, is about more about IDPs actually than refugees these days. They are the often forgotten group <coughs> or, or neglected group. Um, uh, Brian, I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions Syria related, but I would just say one thing because I know Syria becomes the topic of the month very quickly in these events. I would ask we keep a balance here between Syria and the rest of the world because Africa and Asia and other places are mm. even more important in some ways. So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions Syria related. And particularly when, when humanitarian access becomes the political issue, a la Syria, because there's no political progress, when it becomes so <coughs> politicized, when the Security Council is talking about access instead of trying to deal with the politics, which they can't agree on, a and when the host government says, no, you can't go cross-border into rebel areas, you can <coughs> only go from our side, and the UN backs off, as they have to in those situations, probably. Um, what do you, how do you see it from ICRC's <coughs> point of view? What do you do? Do you only work through the government with government approval? I guess I know the answer, but if you do, how do you do it? Who do you use as your partner? The Syrian government says Syrian Arab Red Crescent is the deliverer in, in general terms, I think. Mm -hmm. 
Is that is that a, a, a formula that you uh, comfortably accept, or are, are there other variations? Perhaps a few words on that. Okay, thank you, Dennis. <coughs> Perhaps b before we we launch into the the Syria discussion, uh, um, to to uh, I to have a go at answering your question about working with partner organisations and remote control, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's true there is a there is a a, a, a trend. Um, that says um, humanitarian organisations need to increase their engagement with local partners um, where we work. Um, and, and one of the things we see <coughs> is indeed that there is more outsourcing <coughs> by, well, by the United Nations, by international NGOs to local partners. Um, and with the added impact that local knowledge adds to all of that, um, to all of that um, delivery mechanism. Maybe just to be, perhaps it's not politically correct to, to, to speak on this point, but just to add a, a word of caution, and, and that's what we were discussing earlier, um, this issue of protection. Um, so whilst it's, um, there is an added, uh, obvious added impact in terms <coughs> of delivering assistance, wha what we would call an ICRC assistance, or relief, <coughs> there are th we would argue that there are limits to the protection that can be provided by these local partners. That, uh, and this is, I guess, the, the little kind of, in, in politically incorrect thing, that you actually do need expats on the ground when it comes to issues around, um, uh, obviously around detention and around um, pr um, conduct of hostilities and other general protection measures, because it's simply um, too ambitious to, to uh, and too risky oftentimes to ask local people to have that dialogue. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to, to make that point. Mm -hmm. um, then I in terms of Syria, uh, how we work, <coughs> um, uh, I mean, we work in Syria as we work in 79 other contexts around the world. Um, that is to say, um, we, we have a partner, a privileged partner in the local Red Cross, or in this case Red Crescent uh, Society, the Syrian uh, Arab Red Crescent, um, who are um, doing, um, uh, well take, doing marvellous work on the ground. They're taking risks every day um, to deliver aid to, to, to all sides in the conflict. Um, volunteers who are taking uh, huge risks, in, indeed uh, we have 18 volunteers of the Syrian Ar Arab Red Crescent who have been killed um, uh, since the beginning of this, uh, of this conflict. Um, um, at the same time there's been a lot of media um, concentration on this business about working cross-border or working cross-line in Syria. <coughs> and here the ICRC position is is again uh, one of working to have uh, the consent of everybody involved, and what that means is that we don't do cross-border activities uh, into Syria um, without the agreement of the uh, of the host government, which uh, to this point in time we don't have. Um, so what we do is we do cross-line, um, so that basically means moving within the country to move across the lines. Um, it's not a From government to non-government areas. Uh, and vice versa, yeah. yeah. Um, so, the, the, I mean, the challenge there, of course, in Syria, as, as, as everybody knows, is that it's not like a classical war where you have a kind of an obvious front line and, um, you know, you know where you stand in terms of movements. The situation in rural Damascus or, or in uh, Aleppo today is that you often have members of, um, well, government supporters and members of the armed opposition living basically in the same territory. Um, and then front lines can be a street today and it can be a different street tomorrow in, in, in urban context. So it, it is a bit of a challenge, um, but we, um, in summary, we, we, we rely on the Syrian Arab Red Crescent to, um, and our own expat staff on the ground to, to do these cross-border um, operations. I mean, it, it's a difficult situation uh, and the, we'd be the last people to say, look, you know, all humanitarian needs are being met but clearly in Syria they're not. There are huge unmet needs, um, and it's a frustration for ICRC, it's a frustration for MSF, who are doing some marvellous work on the ground in, in, in the north. I just read today, that you, Mark, you've opened your fourth hospital um, uh, inside Syria, and, and the protection of the medical mission and the provision of um, medical treatment is just a huge priority, so we, 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 um, we commend you for the work that you're doing in that respect as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Um, maybe Sarah and then Mark, uh, perhaps just on the Syria-related themes. 
any views when the government says no way, mm. only through us, only through our areas. Uh, you're not allowed to go anywhere in our country otherwise, which m many of these governments do say, of course. Uh, any thoughts on that? Is there a responsibility to protect which overrides national sovereignty, this old theme that we've heard about for so long? Or is that <coughs> R2P rapidly fading in the face of the Syrian-type resistance? Um, and if you do want to override it, how do you do it? Humanitarian corridors? What areas of tranquility? Who protects that? How do you protect it? How do you deliver? How do you monitor? Just mm. a few thoughts on that sort of package, perhaps Sarah sure. and then Mark. I think there is, you know, a few challenges, and and you know, it's a question that, in a way, uh, inc involves many others. Um, rather than approaching this from the point of view of R two P, because I think that agenda has been so politicized that I'd, I'd rather focus on, you know, really the issue of, of consent and how that is dealt with in mm. uh, international humanitarian law, because you know, uh, of course, that is at the heart of the problem in contexts like Syria and, and Sudan, and is, uh, um, you know, obviously when when the government cannot or does not want to fulfill its responsibility to um, address the needs of civilians and does not allow you know, humanitarian organizations to come in to address that need. <coughs> What do you do? You know, how um, how do you deal with that with the lack of consent? And, and of course, international humanitarian law, you know, I entails a balance needs to be struck between military necessities and the requirements of humanity. But <coughs> where does that end? You know, where is the limit? Where the the um, the needs of the populations are so obvious, mm -hmm. uh, as in the case of Syria, but also in in the case of Sudan. And there could be, you know, reasons why you know a government does. Does, you know, feels that he cannot allow organizations in. There is a lot of you know mistrust of uh, the aims of humanitarian organizations today. You know, there is a feeling that aid may be um, used for for different purposes. You know, there, there there are there are reasons beyond just the deliberate intent to block aid reaching mm -hmm. civilians. You know, there, there, there is a, 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 a I think for me that is a very mm -hmm. important element. Um, but it's it's also you know clear that I think international law it needs to be. Um, a lot more, uh, well, a lot clearer about you know how, um, to what extent relief actions you know should be allowed in. You know, to d be clearer about what are the limitations of what you know governments saying no to to relief be brought in. Because at the moment we've got it in the in 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 relation to international conflicts when communities are facing starvation. I think that is probably the only element that allows you know sort of some some um, um, no consensual action. But when it comes to internal conflict, we don't have you know that same. Um, clarity and and you know in many ways it would be useful to have a clarification in this respect and perhaps you know it, a clarification around the obligation to accept relief um, for for states we've done some work you know internally looking at where you know if there are precedents and, and, and we have found the precedents I don't know how how you know well known it is but there was a, um, a, um, a ruling by the International Court of Justice in 1986 in the case of uh, um, Nicaragua versus the United States of America, where you know the Court of Justice was you know deliberating that you know giving support to paramilitary groups, you know mi giving military support was clearly unlawful, but giving and and this is the ruling of the court, uh, humanitarian aid could not be regarded as an unlawful intervention as long as it was limited to the purposes allowed by the practice of the Red Cross. And you know the, the ruling goes very clearly to say you know to prevent and alleviate human, human suffering, to protect life and health, ensure respect for human being. But then he stresses very importantly the the, the conditions, which is very much you know that above all the aid must be given without discrimination to all in need. You know stresses the principle of impartiality very strongly. And I think that's where the debate is. You know you may be driven to want to go in and, and, and assist communities by the principle of humanity, but that needs to be tempered by the principle of impartiality. And if you're assisting communities only on one side, what does that mean? If you're assisting only part of the communities in, non in a non-consensual way, what does it mean for the others? Where the, how do you, you know, kind of um, um, deal uh, with, with uh, um, maintaining your impartiality as a humanitarian provider. Um, and then, of course, there is you know, what you allude to in terms of how you protect <laughs> your own staff and the communities in this, because obviously um, it, it will inevitably expose you know, communities and, uh, um, and, and staff to 
possible retaliation by belligerents with whom you know the the access has not been negotiated and agreed. Um, and I mean, you, you talk about the corridors of tranquility. I've always felt that unless there is a very solid agreement around you know the, the, these corridors they become the 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 favorite sort of shooting corridor you know mm -hmm. it's, it's the the place where they can target you know your your convoys your staff much more easily because you know at which point you're coming in and we've seen you know in so many cases this happening likewise you know with the famous um safe areas um mm -hmm. i mean were they mm -hmm. safe in bosnia surely not i mean we know only too well protected areas. exactly protected areas what, mm -hmm. what happened to them so yeah. A lot of, I think, caveats there about you know creating. I mean, the 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 heart of the um, for me is really this uh, this the n a solid negotiations and agreed negotiations. If that is not in place and yeah, the, the mm. uh, an, an impartial conduct which will um, mm. allow you to have much more durable access to the communities. Otherwise, it can be very temporary and very yeah. risky. Yeah. Military corridors easier than humanitarian corridors, Mark. Yeah, ma no, maybe just picking up on that point. I mean, it's almost exactly when you would talk about a humanitarian corridor or the need for one that it's least likely y that you're going to be able to create one that's effective. I mean, it is, you know, I, I think one thing is a ceasefire or, you know, a day of tranquility or something like that. And, you know, that's a lot different than you know, probably using military force to create some kind of zone in which you're able to operate and the, yeah. you know, the, how you would do that without it creating a bias in and of itself or be created on the basis of a bias how you know in a very politicized context people wouldn't see that you know th it'd be very hard to think of a neutral humanitarian actor and then I, I, I think at some point it's just the last thing you need in these countries is are, are more actors on the ground with guns. I mean, you know, that's the problem they're having. Too many people running around with guns, and even if they're supposedly good guys with guns, I, I think it just adds, you know, it, it remilitarizes that context. And I think, you know, Shrebenica is, you know, the idea that these safe havens are, are somehow safe and the false impression that, that they might create, uh, uh, I think, are, are risks that really need to be taken with some you know, uh, some degree of seriousness as to wh what it is you're asking people to do, and that's put their trust in something that might fall apart very, very quickly. Um, I think, you know, going back to this whole idea of, you know, what do you do when, when you don't get consent? I mean, you know, MSF is not inside government-held areas of Syria right now, and that, that is a, you know, a serious problem for MSF. We have not been able to obtain the government's consent to come in, um, and we cannot enter uh, you know, in some kind of clandestine fashion, uh, government-held areas. Um, I think, you know, to a certain extent, it, it really does come back to asking ourselves these questions that Sarah was just raising. I mean, you know, we don't really understand. It's not like people, uh, uh, governments don't, they don't say, here are the reasons why we want to keep you out. Uh, uh, and we don't really understand it. And I think we do have to ask ourselves the questions around that. You know, is our aid impartial? You know, are, are we able to see where the aid goes? Because there's a difference between a, you know, a deliberate attempt to block aid that we're talking about because, well, let's say, we don't want aid to help our, you know, help people on the other side, and a deliberate attempt to block aid because aid is being used, you know, by, the, by, by political opponents or siphoned off into, you know, for instance, feeding the military or something like that that we've seen in other countries. Um, I think the other issue is there, you know, to what extent, and it goes back to the perception of us as actors, I mean, do, are we seen as neutral? Or are we seen as aid, Western aid, as some kind of Trojan horse? And that's a term you've, we've heard used around Syria. And it, you know, if people perceive us as a potential Trojan horse, or if you, you know, I think some of the things Sarah was alluding to, when vaccination campaigns <coughs> are used by governments to identify the location of Osama bin Laden, it then, becomes, you know, it, it is not a wacky idea of some kind of, you know, m a, 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 a jihadi or a, a Islamist group on the ground. It's not a wacky idea that a Western vaccination campaign might be, you know, harboring something more than just Western NGOs who say, oh yeah, we want to come into this conflict zone because we're really good people and we really just want to give you aid, which actually seems, you know, the idea of running towards a conflict zone without any other intention seems a bit odd anyway, I, 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 I assume. Um, and uh, behind you, yeah, <laughs> the other, I mean, just, I, I think, 
Another thing to remember, though, is that the consent to, for instance, come into a country and work there isn't the end of the game. And you know, increasingly within countries where we are working legally, you know, consent and the need for government authorization to, to move and do anything is, is becoming increasingly difficult in some places to obtain as governments take control o over their territory. And so it's, you know, the consent in the big picture isn't the end of your, your need for negotiating access on a very regular basis. Um, and I think that's probably, I mean, I, I do think, uh, maybe just to touch on MSF in Syria, I, I mean, we, we you know, thank you, Brian, for what you said. I mean, we, we have managed to open up now uh, a fourth hospital. We are essentially in the northern area, working in from uh, uh, Iraq and from Turkey, we've managed to open up uh, uh, hospital capacity and some mobile clinic capacity, but it's very, very limited and very insufficient compared to the needs on the ground. Um, and, you know, while we have never obtained the consent of the Syrian government to do that, I, I think it's fairly clear that we have obtained at least their forbearance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, we have notified them, we've informed them, where, you know, what we are doing. Um, and while they don't say, yes, go ahead, we are, we are <coughs> still there. And I think that's evidence of at least, it, it's certainly not formal acceptance. But can I ask, one, as one of the more adventurous NGOs historically, MSF, are there situations, not so, forget Syria, where you would go cross-border to deal with extreme humanitarian needs without the approval of any authorities, if you could? I mean, I, I, I think that's the sans frontier is exactly that's that idea. Um, th I think the if you could, though, it is something that's changed <coughs> over time. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, it was pretty easy to cross from Zambia into Angola, uh, into Unida areas mm -hmm. of Angola, and work without anybody really knowing about it. I think today... Um, uh, yeah, if your own comms team doesn't publicize it <laughs> <laughs> in some kind of <laughs> fundraising effort, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, um, yeah. apologies to the comms people. <laughs> um, too late. No, but, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too late. No, but I, I just think it's yeah. becoming increasingly <laughs> difficult to okay. work in that cross-border okay. fashion, and it does, again, I think the other thing that's happened with the way that, that information moves, and it's something we were talking about beforehand a little bit, is that, you know, if you violate uh, that trust of a government, if you are, you know, violating the sovereign space of a government in one part of the world, no matter how justified you, you think of it, when you're negotiating for access halfway around the world, somebody might not share that opinion and, and might see you as an organization that does not respect sovereignty. And what does that say for your negotiating strategy elsewhere? So okay. it's, it's not a decision taken very easily. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you agree, but interrupt me if you don't, I was going to move now, jump a bit from this agenda because we're running a bit behind schedule. Uh, and Sarah, and ask you to say a few words about your long experience in Sudan, both Darfur and South Cordoba and Blue Nile, where many of us are still grappling unsuccessfully mm. with access questions. Um, what has worked? What hasn't worked? Is there anything in your horizon that you think might work where you have a complete impasse on South Cordoba and Blue mm. Nile still, despite the last talks in Addis, apparently? Uh, no international access to probably a million people or, or, or less, who knows? Um, a few words of wisdom on that before we move? Sure, well maybe let me tell you something about what worked because I mean this whole crisis for me is such a massive deja vu because of course I was working with the UN um, in the late 90s in Sudan and you know I had the brief for South Cordova it was called Nuba Mountains at the time you mm. know by everybody. The Nuba Mountains are still part of South Cordova mm. but we're referring to it as South Cordova now. Um, and, and of course, access was blocked at the time, officially. You know, Nuba was closed for 13 years. There was no um, access allowed formally by the government of Sudan into the SPLM controlled areas. Um, that was um, up to 2001, 2002, when you know, access finally opened up. And the reason uh, why it opened up, much as I'd like to claim it because it was uh, you know, up to the fantastic action of the UN mm. and the operation <laughs> that I led, mm. it was actually because of very strong political engagement. There was no other reason, which is you know, exactly why it's not happening today, because of the lack of it. We had um, a couple of very strong um, political drivers. You know, the first one was uh, the Dunford Initiative, you know, by the US, by Senator Dunford, and Nuba was one of the pillars. He had four pillars. Mm -hmm. Nuba, the access to Nuba was one of the four pillars, and he negotiated relentless with the government of Sudan to make sure that this would happen, that this would end up with the agenda, backed by the Swiss government that then, you know, negotiated the Bergenstock Agreement and the ceasefire for, uh, for the Nuba Mountains. And because of, you know, geopolitical uh, considerations. I think 9-11 was uh, 
um, probably the, the only positive uh, byproduct of 9-11 was um, facilitating mm -hmm. access into Nuba Mountains in Sudan and of course the whole comprehensive peace agreement process. You know, it gave a new impetus to the talks in Sudan because of, uh, I guess, you know, um, uh, what was happening in Afghanistan and other places and Sudan, you know, becoming, it sort of changing the terms of its relations with, uh, um, with other countries, with Western countries. But I would say, you know, coupled with that, political engagement goes only so far. I think there was also a vision, you know, at the UN at the time of of uh, the humanitarian coordinator under which I served, you know, of Roger Guarda, of actually putting a lot <coughs> of resources into negotiating access. So when he took um, up his position as a humanitarian coordinator, I remember I was called into his office at nine o'clock in the morning the day after, and he basically said to me, you, your job has changed. You just leave everything you're doing. You have only one task, and it's to negotiate access to Nuba Mountains. Nothing else. You've got just one objective, and then we can discuss how, you know, how we get there. And it was you know, with me and a, a team behind and you know, the resources, because there was an understanding that to negotiate access, there needed to be a constant engagement on both sides. The time, and I always, I always say, I think part of it was the very many bad teas drunk in hot offices in Khartoum that I think got us there, you know, creating that relation with people in the government of Sudan and of yeah. course with the SPLM as well that you know, allowed us to, to go there. A and together with that was then the creation of very flexible agile ad hoc structures that allowed you know to this you know, it, it access is not just the first day it needs to be uh, continuous it needs to be you know allowed on a continued basis and we had a very you know agile operation with the uh, um, the Nuba Mountains response you know, with an impact but also with the friends of Nuba Mountains which were the political body they oversaw you know this uh, um, this operation, and with the JMC, the Joint Military Commission, which wasn't a UN peacekeeping peacekeeping mission, was a much lighter, a much more flexible and responsive um, ceasefire monitoring mission. And I think it was the combination of these three together that worked really well. Um, and so I guess that applies to today. You know, it is that mm -hmm. creativity, the flexibility, the relentless engagement, mm -hmm. and the resources and time that went into it that okay. made it possible. This is not happening today. Okay. We Incredible don't see. Support. Exactly. We don't. I mean, I was just thinking um, uh, as I was preparing for this meeting. When was the UN resolution? We have a UN Security Council resolution on South Kordofan and Brunei, and the day after tomorrow, it will have been a year since Resolution 2046 was passed. Mm -hmm. A year, and the resolutions entailed, amongst many things, between you know South um, uh, no, uh, Sudan and South Sudan. A very specific section of the resolution is about South Kordofan and Brunei and humanitarian access. And it gives a very, you know, kind of clear um, uh, time uh, for, this, for the resolution of the impasse on access, which is three months, or well, it's a year later, and there's mm. been no enforcement. Mm. And I think, you know, even though we had some political, you know, uh, sort of drivers that, that led to the resolution, there was absolutely no, you know, the, 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 ri the, the right dip diplomatic channels and the political will to go, you know, forward with enforcing no the resolution. No consensus in the Security Council. And again. Yes, no consensus in the Security Council, and, and uh, no, I think also a lack of understanding of the crisis, because I think part of the problem with South Kordofan and Brunei is that they continue to be seen as a North-South problem, rather than mm. a Sudan problem, mm. you know, that is related to problems of governance mm. within Sudan. So they continue to be seen as this bargaining chip that has been since, you know, the time of the negotiations of the comprehensive peace agreement between the two. And mm. so uh, when, s when things start to settle between Sudan and South Sudan, the the three areas, so particularly the two areas, I'd say the ABA is a bit different, mm. get forgotten, you know, get deprioritized because they're not seen as warranting, you know, a focused response in, in itself. Right. So I, mean, I yeah. think we, we yeah. still the lessons yeah. are there. It's about, yeah. you know, this, this yeah. political will that is, you know, and required above all. And just interesting to add to that, AU, League of Arab States, and UN mm. tripartite agreement yes. on access given to both parties last year. Do you follow that thing? Yeah, and that's part of the same resolution. The, um, the three big organizations yeah. of, the, of the region, of the world, completely unable to implement delivery of aid to uh, hundreds of thousands of people, yes. for example. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. Uh, 